The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Lord, you. Jesus entered a village where a woman whose name was Martha welcomed him. She had a sister named Mary who sat beside the Lord at his feet, listening to him speak. Martha, burdened with much serving, came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me by myself to do the serving? Tell her to help me. The Lord said to her in reply, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and worried about many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, and it will not be taken from her. The Gospel of the Lord. Now, today's um, readings are really all about service, and I want you to listen closely to the comparisons between the way Abraham serves and the way Martha serves. First thing you might have noticed in the, in the first reading is, right at the beginning, the Lord appeared. And then it says, looking up, Abraham saw three men. Well, is it the Lord or is it three men? And I think this icon looks like three men sitting at a table, but it's really meant to, as we reflect on it, to think of the Trinity, the divine presence, the Lord appearing to Abraham, and he's serving them at table. So a little visual aid this morning, those three men representing the Trinity. And it's interesting, as Abraham addresses these three men, he just refers to them as sir, a singular address. One God in three persons. And then he says to them, I'm going to serve you rather minimally. I'm going to bring you some water. Right? I'm going to bring you a little food that you may refresh yourselves, not stuff yourselves, just a little food that you may refresh yourselves, and then you can go on your way. So, like, I'm going to give you a snack. But then everything speeds up. It says, Abraham hastened to tell Sarah to provide three measures of fine flour to make rolls. Well, Three measures of fine flour is half a bushel of flour. Now, that sounds like more than a little snack, right? Then he runs to the herd, not walks, and somebody approaching 100 years old, which Abraham was, do not run gracefully, right? He runs to the herd. He picks out a tender choice steer. Now, again, meat isn't like it is today. That was very rare, right, that they would have a meal of meat. So this snack is now going to be the best, the choicest steer. And then the servant quickly prepares it. So notice the immediacy, again, of being a good servant. Then Abraham stays with them and waits on the three men as they ate. So he's attentive to them while they're eating. He doesn't just like serve them and then get lost. He stays with them in case they need anything else. And then as a reward, one of the three says, we'll return to you next year and your wife Sarah will have a son. And of course, Sarah is getting up there in years. So that's, in a sense, a reward for Abraham's tremendous service of the divine. Now on the other hand, we've got Martha. And I always have to say, whenever I talk about Martha, for you Marthas out there, just come see me after Mass and get it off your chest. Okay, um, because Martha is not quite Abraham. In fact, if you listen to the words she says to Jesus, who is their guest? So imagine your sibling, your sister, sitting next to your guest, and then you walk up to Jesus and you say these words. Lord, 
Do you not care that my sister has left me by myself to do the serving? Now, she could have just addressed her sister, right? She could have just said, hey, I'm Mary, a uh, little help in the kitchen. But she doesn't. Instead, she goes straight to Jesus and says, do you not care? Step back a second. Would you do that to a guest in your house who's there visiting with your sister? Do you not care? Reminds us of the disciples in the boat when Jesus is sleeping. Instead of just gently waking him up, hey, Jesus, it's, it's getting stormy out here. The waves are getting kind of high. What do they do? Master, do you not care that we are perishing? What? Right? So she gives Jesus a little reprimand, right? Do you not care that my sister has left me by myself to do the serving? It gets worse. Tell her to help me. Now, I don't know about you, but I usually don't tell God what to do. I hopefully ask. Sometimes it's not a good ask. Sometimes it's an ask. Asking him to conform his will to my will, so I'm actually telling or informing him what my will is. But hopefully it's an ask and not a tell. But she tells him, God, right, tell her to help me. Does that sound like Abraham? Okay. And then Jesus says in reply, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and worried about many things. And your sister here has need of only the one thing, which is to listen to my voice. Because as she's listening to his voice, she's learning about who she is and whose she is. That she's a child of God. But Martha, again, is burdened with much serving. Not joyful as Abraham is, trying to run around and as fast as he can provide them more than they could ever eat in one meal. Instead, she's burdened, not so joyous. So, now that I beat up on Martha, and some of you out there may have felt that, um, let's talk a little bit about, about who Jesus is. Because... Jesus is the ultimate servant. And Paul understands this. He says so beautifully in, in Philippians chapter 2, Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. So he wasn't grasping at equality, but rather he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave or a servant, if you will. Taking the form of that slave or servant. So we know Jesus is the ultimate servant, right? He said, I did not come to be exalted, but to serve, to serve others. So St. Paul, who writes about Jesus, really, I think, understands this well. And in a book I've been just working with called Living Joy by Chris Stefanik, I'd highly recommend it. Again, Living Joy, Chris Stefanik. He talks about St. Paul, who's writing from prison, Right? And he's writing about rejoicing. And in 2 Corinthians, Paul writes this. Three times I have been beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I have been shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brethren, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night and hunger and thirst often without food, in cold and exposure. So he's giving us a list of all of his suffering. And then in Philippians he writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. Not sometimes, not based on my circumstances, but always. I, again I will say, rejoice. And so the author tells us how Paul turns lemons into lemonade. He says this, You couldn't murder Paul, but you could make him a martyr. So see the turn? Paul's going to turn it and eliminate. You couldn't imprison Paul, but you could shift his ministry from traveling evangelist to writer. You couldn't offend Paul, but you could help give him an opportunity to forgive. Now, this is my favorite one. You couldn't starve Paul, but you could help him fast better. So for those of you that 
just aren't up to cooking one night, I'm going to give you an opportunity to fast. You couldn't put Paul on trial, but you could give him a pulpit to preach from before the world judges. So each time that Paul was meant to suffer, he turned it into something joyful. In another book, uh, Difficult Teachings by Matthew Kelly, he talks um, at length about how we are laying down our lives. And he says something interesting. He says, you are going to lay down your life. In fact, you are laying down your life because we all spend our lives for a cause. So he says, who and what are you laying your down, life down for? Who and what? So here's some examples. He says, some people lay their lives down by working hard and making sacrifices to support their families. Some people do it in defense of goodness and freedom. Some people lay down their lives in service to God and his people. Some lay down their lives in service to the poor. Others lay down their lives by spending their lives serving others through a professional calling. Some lay down their lives to raise their children. But he says it's important that we consider who and what we're laying our life down for. Now Martha was laying down her life with service, but not joyfully. And she probably was honestly more concerned about the serving than she was about Jesus. Where Mary is totally consumed by Jesus. And so that who is important. Who are we laying down our life for? And I think a great example of a person who laid down his life for someone was Monsignor Bob Hofstetter. Father Doug and I and a whole lot of people were at his, one of his funeral masses on Friday at 3 o'clock at the cathedral. And I, I knew Monsignor Bob personally, and I can tell you, he was like the priest's priest. If, if the priest had a most popular or a most dedicated or whatever, Monsignor Bob, if he didn't win most categories, would have always been in the running. He was a very humble servant, but at 94 years old, had served faithfully as a priest for 68 years. 68 years. And when the bishop was giving the homily about Bobby, or Monsignor Robert Hofstetter, it was just so clear of what a wonderful example he was, not just of a servant, but of a joyful servant. Not one burdened, but one on fire with the love for God and God's people. So as we close today, when you think about the necessary thing that Jesus is referring to in the gospel, I think we often try to do better at listening to Jesus as he tells us, as we listen to his voice, who we are, and as I said, whose we are, because we're his children. And finally, when we go to meet the Lord on the last day, a sentence from the deacon ordination rite, and as well as priest, when you go to meet the Lord, when you hear him on the last day, the words you want to hear from Jesus, well done, good and faithful servant, enter the joy of your Lord. May God bless us all.